good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here, uh, colleagues. And uh, I know there's at least one family member in the room, too. So uh, that's very nice. Moral support. Uh, so I'm going to introduce the department head of uh, soil science, who happens to be my colleague as well. And we all know of all of the departments at the University of Manitoba, soil science is the best one. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, and Paul will introduce the uh, speaker. Uh, so Paul Bullock is a professor and former head of the Department of uh, Soil Science at the University of Manitoba. He has a BSc in Agriculture and an MSc in Soil Science from the University of Saskatchewan. We will forgive you for that. Uh, he has a PhD from Center for Resource and Environmental Studies in Australian National University. And formerly, he was a global crop forecaster with the Canadian Wheat Board and a crop application specialist with Noetics Research Inc. His research in agrominerology, so it's difficult to pronounce, uh, focuses on crop uh, modeling, crop risk assessments, and soil moisture assessment methods. So welcome, Paul. OK, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Annika. Glad you got that former head in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thought I might have missed them out. Anyway, it's my uh, pleasure to uh, introduce um, a former graduate student of mine who's now doing very well with Manitoba Agriculture, Timi Ojo. Um, so uh, Timi grew up in uh, Abadan, Abadan, okay, Nigeria. Um, he says it, it's a small city of about maybe three million people, so <laughs> we welcome you to the village of Winnipeg. <laughs> so uh, weekend getaways on his dad's uh, small farm plot was one of his highlights uh, of, his, of his week as a kid. Um, uh, his interest in agrometeorology was based on his experience during his final year project as an under undergraduate when his uh, Plot experiments all got washed away multiple times from torrential rainfall, and so uh, this sparked an interest. He got his uh, MSc and PhD uh, from the Department of Soil Science, University of Manitoba. He conducted research on how weather impacts agriculture and specifically focused on in situ and proximal soil moisture determination, soil moisture sensor calibration, measurement, and modeling. He started working with the province of Manitoba as Provincial Agricultural Meteorology Specialist in 2015. And he oversaw the uh, Manitoba Agriculture Weather Program, which has a network of 108 weather stations across Agro-Manitoba. Timmy says that 2019 was a year he won't forget in a hurry for several reasons. One, he's now transitioned to the Provincial Agricultural Systems Modeler as of last August. So congratulations on that. He's responsible for developing value-added products from weather data. Second, he was president of the Manitoba Soil Science Society and just recently, I think, relinquished that. Yep. So he did a good job there. And of course, number three, as an avid Blue Bomber fan, it was the end of a long-awaited drought. So the Grey Cup was finally won. It's been a banner year for Team E2019. So there we go. Anyway, without further ado, I'm going to introduce him now to come to give us our uh, faculty seminar for today. Welcome, Team e. Thank you very much. I'll be talking about the um, forging a new path, and I would quickly just write up the parts. You would notice that you know some words are cut off. We were trying to fix it before they started, but I'll, tr I'll try to do the best I can. Um, anyways, it's interesting to really just again look at the evolution of weather in Manitoba, um, just so that I can get a quick glance in the room. How many people here have used weather data in the last five, ten years? Most people, not all. How many people actually have weather? affecting the work you do, maybe the study, the research, just anything, anyone? Not all, okay, I wanna get everyone. How many people here have actually checked the weather forecast in the last 72 hours? Okay, everyone, everyone, okay. Cause that's the ticket to stay in the room, otherwise, no, you don't have to go out. But you know, suffice to say that weather affects everything we do. So I thought I'll just give a quick background in terms of, you know, weather monitoring is not new. It's something that has been around for quite a while. And you know, I was doing the research about this as to when did weather monitoring actually start. And um, again, 
3000 BC was actually the earliest writing about weather monitoring in India. And you know, again, most of what we've seen happened didn't happen far out here. It was actually way out um, to the east. And then in 600 BC, actually the word that we use for weather monitoring is mineralogy. And it actually is a Greek word, and it's a combination of two words, mineral and logical. So mineral simply means, you know, being an expert in Greek that I'm not, um, you know, mineral actually means a study of something high in the sky. And logia means the study. So the study of something high in the sky is meteorology. And in 600 BC was actually the recorded first public um, forecast um, on record. And it was based on advising farmers in, in Greece in terms of the upcoming growing season. And then fast forward to around 200 BC, um, that was the first um, discovered, the first invention of hygrometers. And this was in, Ch in China, actually. And then again, it was to advise Chinese farmers on what to expect in terms of the weather for the upcoming growing season. In 1441 was the first standardized rain gauge. And you know, note the word standardized because over the centuries there's been different buckets and different you know, systems to monitor rainfall. But the first standardized rain gauge was actually out of Korea. And it was just a small um, rain gauge bucket, about tw um, 32 centimeters height and 15 centimeters in diameter. And that's standardized. And that became the standard for monitoring um, rain at the time. Over the course of the next two centuries, you know, the 1600s is actually what we consider as the start of the modern science, you know, with folks like Isaac Newton doing amazing research. And in 1714, this is very critical because this was actually the first year in which we had the first reliable thermometer, so monitoring temperature. And this was done by no other person than Daniel Fahrenheit. And again, moving forward, 1871. 1871 was what we know currently as Environment and Climate Change Canada, actually started as the Canadian Meteorological Services in 1871. Before then, there has been, I would say, some outer weather monitoring happening in Canada. Um, there was the Toronto Observatory that started in 1839, but this was the first, I would say, government initiative in terms of monitoring the weather in Canada. Here in Manitoba, though, the first Manitoba Weather Service actually started just before the turn of the century in 1899, and this was the first across the, pr the prairies. So after Manitoba, we had Saskatchewan and Alberta starting off much later. So I know Paul went to University of Saskatchewan. That's OK. But Manitoba is always the first. I just have to say that. You know. So four years after was when Saskatchewan and Alberta actually uh, started their weather uh, monitoring service. And then in 1960 was actually the first successful launch of a satellite dedicated to start, um, checking the weather. And it was the TRIOS, TRIOS-1 launched in 1960. It only was, um, it orbited for about 78 days, but sent thousands of images. You know, today, we use tons of satellite for weather monitoring, but TRIOS was actually, I would say, the very first one launched by NASA in 1960. Um, in the 1990s, the federal government were doing such a great job with weather monitoring that the provinces felt, you know, we need to have a piece of the pie. So the provinces, um, you know, Alberta, Manitoba, and quite a few other provinces actually started having provincial agrometeorology stations um, across Canada. So this is just to give you a generic um, look of the history of weather um, monitoring and how it has evolved over the centuries. Now this location is very critical. It's a very good location for only one reason. Because in 19, no, sorry, in 1872, this was the, somewhere in this red box. Now, we don't know exactly where because the GPS coordinates at the time, if there was one, but the GPS coordinates we have now only gave us up to two decimal uh, places. But we do know that somewhere in this region was where the first weather station, or as I call it, the weather monitoring, because it's not really a station as we have it today, but it would have you know, the glass mercury and the likes to monitor the minimum temperature at the start of the day and the maximum temperature sometime late afternoon. So this somewhere here, close to the Fox, was where we had the very first weather station in Winnipeg in 1872. Now, the weather station actually ran from 1872 to about 1937 and then moved to the airport where it is currently now. And 
if, again, for people that were around at the time, anyone? <laughs> I don't think so. Okay. In, 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 in 1937 was actually when Trans Canada um, Airline actually started, you know, what we know now as Air Canada started as Trans Canada Airline in, um, it, in 1937. And again, the current airports, because of the need for having weather data mainly for you know, um, aviation. So the, air, the weather station moved from where it was close to the Fox um, down to the, the, the airport. Now, beyond having a generic look at weather monitoring, how did weather monitoring evolve here in Manitoba? Now, this chart actually shows the number of stations or the number of weather monitoring locations in Manitoba over the last um, 150 years or so. As I said, the very first one was uh, in Winnipeg, 1872. And this chart shows the number of stations that recorded at least 10 years worth of data. There were some stations or some monitoring location that was only you know, available for a few years, or maybe just for that one year. So instead of putting so many of those information, I decided to put the ones that we can actually use for climatological data that has at least 10 years worth of record. Um, up until 2000, year 2000, and then between 2001 and 2016, I included locations that had about five years' worth of record. And you would notice that we did have quite a steep increase between 1941 up until um, 1981. And that was because after the World War II, uh, most of the soldiers that were coming back, and many people actually discovered, well, we can actually use weather data. And Environment Canada, which is what we call it now by the time, Canadian Weather Services, um, were actively recruiting volunteers. So again, dairy farmers that are always out you know, on their farms, or maybe school, um, school teachers that are always at their location would simply have you know, um, a thermometer to record maximum temperature, minimum temperature, and precipitation. So those were the three data um, information that we had up until, I would say, um, in the 50s or so, when we started having more of those automated um, stations. In 2009, you'd notice, and these are, again, stations that Environment Canada has. As of last year, Environment Canada only has about 40 weather stations and close to 20 volunteer services. So the volunteer services actually declined from about 150 that they had in the, in 19, in the 80s and in the 1960s because again, most of the farmers that were assisting with weather collection, um, again, due to subsection or something like that, they've all maybe, again, move out of the farm or have passed on. So they don't really have as, mu as many stations as they've had in the past. Now, I would want to look at agrominerology in Manitoba specifically. How have we evolved over the last, I would say, half a century or so? And the history, I would say, I would want to start, uh, sorry, the name actually got cut off there. Um, I have Dr. Carl Shekwick there, and he, I want to use the word pioneer agrominerology study here in Manitoba. And he started at the U of M um, Soil Science Department in 1967. And at the time, he actually had his master's and his, um, his grad school as a soil physicist, not as an agrominologist, as a soil physicist. But when he started, when he joined the department in 1967, Dr. Ed Lane, who was the head of the department at the time, told him, well, we've got these tons of data, um, weather data, and we need someone to do analysis to give us information about you know, the spring frost and the fall frost, to give us some agrimological data out of this information. And Dr. Kashoki said, well, why not? I'm going to try to do that. So he picked up the data, ran some analysis, and actually presented the results in the 1968 Manitoba Science Society. So we just finished the conference just a few weeks ago. But it was really neat to see that you know, the 63rd annual MSSS that we did actually started with you know, many of these frontiers that did such an amazing job with uh, you know, the data that they got. Actually, in a report that Dr. Carl Shekwick wrote, he said that when he got the weather data, he got weather data for just two locations, and they came in a box that weighed 20 kilograms. <laughs> for two locations. Now, the same data, you can easily just you know, download it within 10 seconds, pretty much, right? But it's just amazing how things have evolved over time. 1973, again, Canadian Wheat Board, um, we don't have the Wheat Board um, anymore, but then the Canadian Wheat Board at the time actually started the Weather and Crop um, Surveillance Unit 
and Dr. Bullock actually became the director in 1991. Yeah, 91, okay, got my facts right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that was when the Canadian Wheat Board actually, again, they discovered the need to actually focus on how weather impacts agriculture and marketing, and this section was started. And a lot of folks that actually worked in the section are still actively involved in agrimology studies in the province today. I um, mean, 1975 was the first time um, that AgMet course was taught here at U of M, 19, by Dr. Carl Shukwik. I was actually chatting with my boss, Lane, that the first course I took at U of M when I did my grad school was actually in this very room, AgMet course, um, Dr. Paul Bullock at the time, um, about 11 years ago. So Dr. Carl Shokik actually developed the first AgMet course in 1975. Between 1980 to 1985, several graduate students at the University of Manitoba um, Department of Soil Science actually developed the biometrological time scale for soybean. And that is correlating weather data and how it influences and affects the phenology of soybean. Um, in 1987, the Crop Weekly Bulletin started. It's interesting because over the last five years, part of my role is actually to produce crop weather reports. And I was really just, again, have that no nostalgic feeling that, well, this actually started in 87 and we're still doing it today. Because again, farmers are interested in seeing what the weather is doing and how it affects their um, production. In 1994, the province discovered the need to have a dedicated position, um, a, a, someone looking at how weather influences agriculture, and Guy Ash actually became the first agro, um, provincial agrimonologist. And then in 1999, here in Manitoba, the seasonal um, weather network started and it was seasonal because it was put up in the spring and taken down in the fall, and it was driven mostly by um, commodity groups, so the Vegetable Grass Association and Potato Grass Association wanting to monitor weather data at their fields. What we know today as the Manitoba Agriculture Weather Program actually started in 2004-2005, and Andy Nadler um, was the AgMed specialist at the time. And it started with just, again, a couple of stations and quickly grew to about 46 weather stations um, across the province between 2005 and 2014. And that's what brings us to where we are today. 2015 up until now, we've experienced quite a rapid expansion um, in terms of the Manitoba Agriculture Weather Program. So this uh, map actually just shows you the various distribution of the um, locations of the Manitoba, uh, not just Manitoba Agriculture Weather Program, but the public weather um, stations across the province. Um, I don't know if it's very, um, if it's easy to see, but the, bl the, bl the black dots are the Environment Canada stations. So you'd see quite a few of them in the agricultural region and just spread across. The red ones are the Manitoba Wildfire Program and that's why those ones are mostly to the north and I would say to the fringes of agricultural region. And the green ones, which again is the massive one around the agricultural region, is what Manitoba Agriculture Weather Program coordinates. So between all three agencies, we have close to 200 weather stations um, across the province. But again, you can get weather data from different other sources. Um, this is another free resource, Kokoras, uh, mainly precipitation. Uh, with Kokoras, it's a volunteer network. Um, anyone can join. You simply would go through a brief training online. You need to get a graduated cylinder and stick it somewhere in your yard. And every morning, you relay the information to the network. Um, right now, Kokoras, I think, have between 60 to 80 volunteer reporters um, on their website. There are tons of other, I would say, um, private industry that uh, monitors weather, you know, Farmer's Edge has a ton of um, weather stations out there, but again, those are based on subscription, so you can't have access to the data without subscribing and paying a fee for it. So why have we had um, the expansion that we've had so far? In the last, again, um, five years, we've moved from having about 46 weather stations to 108 stations, more than double in just five years. And this is what weather station looks like. Um, I'm not sure if you've seen this um, again in some of your research sites, but it's a term, it, it follows the World Wind Organization standard. So basically, we monitor wind speed at 10 meter height. We have a ton of um, 
weather parameters that we monitor from air temperature, humidity, precipitation, wind speed, and direction. We have solar radiation, which isn't something you see very common at many weather stations. Um, we have soil temperature and soil moisture at four different depths in the ground at 5, 20, 1500 centimeter depth. And I, I'm very sure that one of these stations would likely be within 10 mile radius of where um, you likely have a research site. So part of the goal is to have at least one station every 20 mile radius. Um, later this year, over the next few years, we're also in planning to kind of fill in some gaps. We've identified a few gaps that we are still planning to fill um, in the next little while. So why have we increase the number of stations we had in the last um, five years or so. It was actually based on the report of the 2011 flood review. So for many people that remember in 2011, we had the flood. Um, usually we think of the red as being the one that is most flood prone, which is, that's the case. But in 2011, we were surprised by not just you know, the red, but in the Assiniboine. And part of the recommendation from the task report was the need to actually have a systematic methodology to provide spatial estimate of real-time weather data. So simply put, we need more weather stations. And then the second recommendation, well, it has over 100 recommendations, but another recommendation was the need to have more soil moisture monitoring sites. Before this time, we only had, I believe, four, weather st or four soil moisture monitoring stations that I had put in place during my master's um, program. And in 2011, I remember receiving calls from the flood forecaster almost every week. Oh, Timmy, we need your data. What's happening at Strian and at, you know, Porte de la Perry? And that we only had four um, soil moisture monitoring stations in 2011 at the time. So basically, the province called for uh, the need to have more soil moisture monitoring stations to assist with flood forecasting. And that's one of the reasons, uh, one of those things that really drove the expansion of the network. Uh, but soil moisture, you know, information is not new. I actually saw this map um, from Radzat um, in 1989, and it was based off um, a model. So again, using precipitation, drew a model across the prairie to determine what the um, water holding capacity is um, at that, at, you know, again, that scale. But then, fast forward 15 years later, the Manitoba Agriculture Weather Program started what we call the Fall Moisture Survey. So what this does is we have about 10 to 15 employees go out to various locations across Agro Manitoba, and at the last two weeks in October, or the first week in November, depending on when the freeze up occurs, we would take soil samples to determine what the moisture content is before the soil is frozen, such that it gives us an idea of what to expect in the spring. Now we did this between 2004 up until 2018, and last year was the first time that we did not do it. So last year in 2019, we went completely automated using the station, the um, information from the sensor. And in 2018, we actually did both. So 2018, we used the sensor and we used, you know, again, manual labor as I call it. But then when we correlate the result, it was really just bang on. The advantage of using the sensor is that it tells us exactly, specifically, when you know, the frost occurs. Compared to when we were doing the um, you know, manual sampling in which it, it's possible that we took a sample today and then we think it's going to get frozen next week, but then there's a rain and it doesn't get frozen. So it was really hard to really know at what point but we, we know that we, we will still be within the ballpark because we don't have as much evapotranspiration occurring you know, late in October. So the fact that you know, we took it maybe two weeks earlier before the frost isn't really um, a big deal. So one of the things um, that I get asked a lot is how did we decide on which size sensor to use? Especially with the last three years when things have been really dry, I've had industry and so many people asking, we are looking at monitoring um, soil moisture. What did you guys do? And I always like to think of what we do in Manitoba Agriculture Weather Program as a synergy between field research and weather monitoring. So field research informing what we do, and we, in turn, provide data that follows research. So I see that cyclic relationship occurring. And one of the things we did, um, actually, in 2014 was a project that compared five different um, soil moisture probes 
that are popularly used. So we had the Theta probe, the Echo, the Hydra probe. We had, and those are the three prong braced sensors. And then we also had the um, line sensors, the multi depth sensors, the Enviroscan, and the Diviner. So what we did in this study was actually to look at which of these sensors are adaptable to the heavy clay soils we have here in Manitoba. Because again, we have tons of these stage, um, sensors out um, in, in the public. So based on the results we got at the time, the eyedrop probe actually had the best R-square. It's the most commonly used probe in the States, um, eyedrop probe, Stevens eyedrop probe. The two line sensors, the Diviner and Everoscan, actually add, quote unquote, the, the worst R square. And again, I always like to put the caveat when I present these results because when we were doing this study, we did actually encounter cracks in the clay. And that's normal. When clays are dry, they crack. And when we took the samples for calibration, we had to avoid the cracks. So the, the, punk, um, the, the pointing sensors actually were a better representation of the calibration we did compared to the, the multi-depth sensors. But regardless of what we saw, we noticed that the Hydra probe, which is again what is most commonly used in the States, actually gave us the worst results pre-calibration. So if you were to take the sensor out of the box, and you stick it in the ground or you stick it somewhere to use, at least in every clay cell. Now again, this research was in every clay cell. The hydro probe was the worst. And then the theta probe actually was the best in terms of the root mean square error, gave us less than 3% compared to about 13% that we had in the hydro probe. However, after calibration, the hydro probe was the best. So what this research actually told us, or at least informed us, is that if we're going to do a thorough calibration, and you want to be as accurate as possible, then maybe you should consider using the Hydra probe. But for a network as big as the size of the you know, over 100 weather stations, the capacity and ability to actually do a thorough calibration based on the spatial and the geographical um, distance wasn't really something that we would be able to do. So the next best um, probe to use for us was the Theta probe, and that's what we have across um, the province right now, again, at less than um, 3%. Actually, the NASA research, um, again, that we often reference, they are, I would say the accuracy level they want is 4% root mean square error. So if you have any probe that can give you less than 4%, they consider that, that as a win. So having the Theta probe at just 0 0.023 was actually really good. Now, most people in the room will be familiar with this. This is a soil texture triangle. Not the Canadian one, though. This is from the States. Because the Canadian soil texture triangle is much simpler. We don't like to complicate things, right? You know? Because it, 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 it's a percentage. So if you know two of those of, of three items, you're good to go. So that's why we use the right angle. Um, but that's not the only difference between the two texture triangles. The US um, texture triangle actually has 12 classes. But the Canadian triangle has 13 classes. And what's the difference? Right here, heavy clay. In the States, once you have above 40% clay content, it's all clay, regardless of what it is. Well, except you are the extreme silt or extreme sand. But the Canadian um, classification has heavy clay. And that's because, again, when you consider the Red River um, clays that we have, somewhere like Glen Lee, for folks that have you know, research sites at Glen Lee, at Kelburn Farm, those areas are about 70% clay. They behave way differently compared to what you have maybe at 40%. So part of what we did was to actually look at how this clay influences you know, soil moisture. And if you look at the fine print of most of the instruments that you see, they would actually tell you that the instruments are only valid at specific you know, soil textures. So part of what we looked at is, you know, again, having the research that was conducted to inform our choice in the weather program and also now having the weather program also informing research. Now, this data is actually showing the soil moisture. Again, sorry that there's, um, th that side was cut off. It's the volumetric water content. So it's the amount, the percentage of water in the soil. 
at these um, three different locations, Morris, Shiloh, and at Nassis. So I decided to select, you know, again, three locations, different locations. Um, I included Drifting River. Sorry about that. Just to put this back on. So I included Drifting River because I'm going to talk about it shortly. But what we noticed is that, again, typically in the, uh, sometime in November, all the soil moisture values drop. And that corresponds to when the soil temperature becomes sub-zero. So when soil temperature goes below zero, the dielectric permittivity, because again, the water in the soil turns to ice, so the soil moisture values drop. So looking at, again, just breaking this, um, the, this down into various chunks, late October, early November was when we typically would do the fall moisture survey. So again, it seemed to be okay. So regardless of when you took your survey data, you are still within the ballpark of what you would expect to see. And you know, later in the spring, when it melts, it often goes back to what it was, pre-frozen state, or sometimes even higher than that. And then we have the transition zone, which is when, again, the moisture the soil gets frozen and it drops. And then it stays frozen you know, between um, end of November all the way to sometime in March. And then you have another transition zone happening afterwards. But is this what we typically see? This is what we typically, typically see. But is this all that there is to it? Or can it be different? Now, when I took AGMET class, this is what we expect to see in Manitoba. However, again, having this instrument um, based on the research that we've done, it's showing us that it's not always the case. Now, take this location at Drifting River. Again, Drifting River is um, in the northwest corner of the province, just north of the Riding Mountain National Park. And we didn't see the same type of um, scenario happening. At Drifting River, the moisture content actually did not drop until sometime late January. When we look at the uh, soil temperature, it actually again correlates. This is at five centimeter depth, so only at two inches. So we actually did not have any, um, the, the soil didn't get fr um, frozen until late in January. So what was happening here? Again, typically we expect that the transition zone would happen in November, and then the soil should stay frozen from November till March. But at this location, that's not what we observed. It only stayed frozen at two inches for only six weeks. And then we had the extended transition zone. So was this because you know, the temperature at that location wasn't cold enough? Was that why we saw what we're seeing? You know, this is showing the air temperature values. And actually, at some point, it actually got as low as minus 40 at the location. So it wasn't because it wasn't cold enough. And when I analyzed this data, I looked at the climate normal data for the location, and it was actually a normal year. So it was as cold as it would normally get. But what happened? Why didn't we have you know, the same type of you know, period in which the soil should stay frozen? And that's because earlier on in November, the location actually got about a foot and a half of snow. And the snow created an attenuation effect such that the air temperature wasn't transmitted down to the soil temperature. Now, if I were to model you know, for anything I want to model, I would assume, well, with looking at this air temperature, the soil should definitely be frozen at about almost one meter, one meter depth. But that's not what happened. So this case actually shows us how we can use the data, again, to inform what we see and what we do. Now, I get asked this question a lot, that is everything frozen, everything dormant in frozen soil? And I would like to explain this using, you know, again, this um, little diagram of a soil. So those individual pairs have, you know, spaces in between them called the macro pores. And then we do have the micro pores within the pairs themselves. In a typical soil before it gets frozen, this is what you'd expect to see. You have some hair gaps, you have water, and then you have the pad. So you have water filling inside the pad in the micro pores and in the macro pores. However, when you have the first transition zone in which, again, you have you know, the first um, sub-zero temperature in the soil, 
most of the macro pores actually turns into ice. So that's what causes the drop, the quick drop in the volumetric water content. So there's quite a big drop, again, from about 40% to about 25%, because the macro pores that was filled with water are now filled with ice. And ice has a lower dielectric permittivity. But then, after that, you do have the second phase in which it's still gradually dropping off, and the volumetric water content is still dropping off, but not as, at, as a fast rate, at a fast rate as what we had initially. And that's because at this point, m the macro pores are already frozen, and now the micro pores are now gradually getting frozen. So those are the edges inside the pad are getting frozen. And then you do have you know, the last phase in which I consider this at equilibrium. You don't really have a lot of changes happening in the soil matrix because, again, the micro pores are already frozen as much as they would, although there would still be some unfrozen soil moisture inside um, the soil. This chart from um, a paper written in Sciences in Code and Arid Region actually very well illustrates this concept in which that, you know, depending on the soil texture, you actually do have unfrozen soil water content even in a frozen soil. So even when you have up to minus 10 degrees, in sand, yes, you do have most of the macro pores already frozen, but then in clay, you actually do have sometimes up to 20% uh, on frozen moisture content, even though you have a frozen status. So what does this tell us in terms of dormancy in soil? You know, research around um, soil microbiology or in terms of pests and disease that actually are part of their life cycle in the soil, are they able to persist through with having access to unfrozen moisture content? So having information such as these and you know, data that actually shows us, really helps us and informs what we do and how we approach research. Um, in, in wrapping things up, again, talking about forging new parts, I would want to just quickly talk on these three various aspects that Mind to Agriculture Weather Program is um, doing in terms of data generation, data analysis, and data application. In terms of data generation, it's something that we've actually been doing. So right now, you know, if you go on our website, this is what you would see. Um, I always say, don't try to, you know, memorize the link because it has quite an extended link. Just go to the search bar and search, you know, current weather conditions, it's gonna pop up. Um, one of the results would be this link. But when you look at the um, daily reports, this is what it shows up. You can select a station, and then when you select the station, you put in the planting date, end date. It gives you basic information in terms of, you know, the average um, temperature, maximum temperature of the precipitation. Um, two years ago, we launched this um, website, it's a ArcGIS online website, because again, a lot of farmers were telling us they wanted to see what the weather is doing at a generic scale, at a spatial scale. So with this, you are able to see what is happening at all our stations in a glance. This page updates every hour, and you can see again um, the precipitation, wind speed, and so, so much information, again, updating every hour. Something that we're working on currently that, again, we actually need testers to help us with the beta test, and this is still in beta phase, and it's, it, will, it will be launched um, in another few months, we hope. But this is a joint initiative between Mind to Bioculture Weather Program and Mind to Infrastructure, and the green dots are where you see, again, the weather stations, and the blue dots are for the hydrometrics, so the water level. Um, so basically, I'm actually gonna play there as a small one minute video that actually just shows what this page does. So you can zoom in to any specific location. In this case, I've zoomed in to Woodlands and selected a location um, at Woodlands, which is just north of um, Winnipeg. And you can actually, again, at Woodlands, select, you know, you can export all the data available, or you can select the last seven days if you want. We also have various um, different parameters. We are again, continuing to build more and more information into this database. But you can, again, chat, you can select a parameter of interest. Right here, I've selected air temperature, and you can chat it. So this shows the air temperature over the last 24 hours, and when I created this on Monday. But then, if you're interested in all the data, you don't have to look and select daily, monthly, annually, depending on the um, temporal 
frequency that you are interested in. I've selected the all data. So currently, uh, we've loaded data up onto from 2018. Um, again, over time, we'll keep loading the data since you know, the station started. Woodlands actually was installed, I believe, 2011. So we have data up on 2011. So this shows you the data that we have at that location. And you can, again, just select a particular location of um, time of interest. So you can zoom in to see what is happening at any specific day. Um, we've actually used, have our data used for so many things. So again, we are hoping that this would be something that many people in the room will take advantage of to actually access weather data. You can do basic statistics, you know, just basic summation. Um, you can chat, you can d export the data and export the uh, image as well. So we are quite excited about the launch of this that's coming up shortly. Um, and again, hopefully you guys will be interested in it. But beyond data generation, we are hoping to, again, move a step ahead into data analytics. And we've done quite some things in the past. Again, we typically would do the growing degree days and the con its unit, you know, evapotranspiration, the, the, the basic data analysis. But we are hoping to, again, with the amount of data we generate, we feel there's nothing stopping us from actually, again, using the computing um, power that we have now, again, with things like Fortran for folks that use PyCharm or maybe Jupyter, whatever you use. But again, we are able to do more, so much more with the data we currently generate. Part of what initiative that we are planning to actually work on is generating nowcast. So looking at weather forecast over the next one to six hours based on the information that we collect right at that station and at um, nearby station as well, such that farmers that are looking at, let's say, um, you know, planning to go out to spray would know in the next little while this is what they should expect at their location. Um, finally, I'll just touch on a few data application. Again, um, over the course of my um, again involvement and work with the weather program, we've had such a wide range of data application. Um, actually, in 2018, 17, our data was used for a plane crash. I don't like that there's a plane crash, but I was happy that our station was nearby to provide information on the conditions at the time. So we've had our, you know, the, our stations, our data used for so many things. And in the past, I would say we've been quite passive about it, passive in the sense of we provide the data and we sit back. But right now, we are, we are engaging in research as well. And one of those is you know, crop disease risk. Again, most folks in the room are familiar with the disease triangle. Um, susceptible host, again, host, yeah, they do change because, again, sometimes you have mutation occur, um, occurring. But then again, hosts are, no, are pretty much stable, I should say, sorry. It's the pathogens that do change. Sometimes you have mutation in pathogens. But one of the most, well, I would say the most variable um, factor of all three is the environment. And um, Kate actually last year defended her thesis. And Kate in her thesis actually showed the um, number of fusarium damage kernel. And if we take a look at what happened at Indian Ed and Calberry, Indian Ed up to 4% um, fusarium um, kernel damage in 2016. And that correlated with the intense um, precipitation we had that year. So in 2016, it was so wet, Indian Ed had close to um, about 130% above normal in the first 60 days um, of the growing season. When you contrast that to what happened in 2017, Indian Ed, the exact same location in 2017, had nothing. And that's because, again, in terms of the precipitation, it was just 65% of normal, so about 35% below normal. So we see, you know, again, that weather plays an important role in crop disease. And we are, again, um, doing a research, again, with Dr. Paul Bullock and quite a few other um, collaborators across the prairies to develop a risk model to improve the effectiveness of fusarium head blight mitigation in Western Canadian small grains. So this is a project that we're actively involved in. Um, we're actually, again, um, networking with other uh, partners in other provinces, supplying the weather data to really see how we can drive a model to assist farmers in developing a risk model. Um, the other work that we're doing is on Puerto late blight as well. And again, as I said, there are tons of research that I can mention, but because of time, I just like to highlight this. But one of my favorite aspects that the data that we use is being applied is in teaching. So instead of professors coming up with case scenario, um, Dr. Brianna Miro actually, um, we worked together last year to provide actual weather data sets 
for students in class, again in the intro to AgMed class, to really just evaluate crop production in that same growing season. So students in the class were able were provided with various weather data. And instead of having the same weather data for every student, you know, again we've got 108 stations. So every student have their own data set. You know, again, it's a lot of homework I realize, but yeah, that's okay. And at the end of, this, uh, of the um, exercise, you know, I spoke with Dr. Brian Amiro and he, he said, you know, he was so thankful as to how having access to the real data and some students in class actually selecting a location that is close to home for them and seeing how the data that they observe over the course of the growing season was actually being used in a class scenario. So again, this is something that, this is actually an example of what the data text looks like that um, we created for, for the class. So again, this is an example of how we can actually use, again, data, not just in research, but even in teaching um, scenarios. Um, as I wrap this up, I was thinking about this, and in reflection, how many times have you had one of these you know, in presentations in terms of you know, whether likely played a role in the results? But, and we think that you know, the results would be different if the weather had been this. So instead of you know, looking at those, why don't we proactively in setting up experimental design to look at how the information we have, and I'd say you know, with the weather network that we have in the province, it's such a golden opportunity, and I can't think of any better audience that can take advantage of the data than the people in this room right now. So I would want to encourage you to think about how weather plays a factor in the research you do, in the study you do, and again, let's see if we can engage in a conversation as to how we can provide information and that are pertinent to your study. With that, I want to say thank you very much. Um, I want to appreciate, again, my colleagues with the Minds Agriculture Weather Program. It's quite a small um, team, but we're doing amazing things. And then again, I would want to thank you know, so many people that you know, time will feel me to mention. Definitely my wife, thank you so much for being here. Um, Dr. Paul Bullock, Dr. Shark, um, Carl Shekwick, Don Flating, and so many people that have really contributed in my journey. And as I, like, again, walk through being a grad student, working on this um, project, and again, working with the Mind to Bar Weather Program. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take questions. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. 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 Oh, thank you. Yeah. He's not going to answer anything though. He's got his gift for it. So I will not. Best of luck. Yeah. Is there questions? Yeah. Thank you very much for that presentation. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, question. So. I think you were referring to that. So there's also some commercial uh, things going on right now, uh, weather stations, and, and, and you have to pay licenses for that and, and things. Uh, is, is the Manitoba government, are they, are they working together with those industries? And, and can you maybe you know, expand on what you already have? By, by yeah, that, that's a very good question. So the question is if the Manitoba government is working collaboratively with industry that have weather stations and weather network. And the answer would be yes and no. Yes, in the sense that for industry partners that are willing to engage in conversation, we are actively open to having conversations. So I've had conversations in the past with regards to the exact same thing I was presenting on, um, which sensor should they use, and I've had industry um, meetings with industry partners, so we do engage in those conversations. And I should say as well that the weather stations and the weather network that we have in the province provides a generic spatial information. It does not replace you know, individual agrologists or agronomists that are you know, discussing with farmers on the ground. So we do say that, again, we provide information on the higher level, but the information may or may not be relevant specifically to individual fields. So what we won't do as you know, government employee is to provide specific field-related information. Um, that's the role that we believe the gap that you know, the, 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 the specialists would fill that are working closely to the farmers. But yes, we do have those conversations with industry. Um, I would say again, for some other network, um, they may be following industry standard based on what their partners are doing maybe in the states. So for industries or for companies that have um, 
organizations outside Canada may want to standardize things across you know, their various countries. So in those, they would go with what they want to go with regardless of what we are doing. So that's why I said yes and no. Yeah, yeah really good question. Thanks. Any questions? Yes, sir. Yes, thank you, thank you very much. Thanks for the presentation. And I'm looking at here the growth of the weather station. And it's very interesting. Um, and then I start thinking very well as well what you saw as you're doing exactly the same thing that you're doing. Initially, we had a lot of weather stations. And then suddenly, the government decided to start cutting. And the weather stations are the first ones to go because it's very expensive to maintain. So I'm, I'm just wondering, I mean, are you not worried? I mean, you know, the change of government, they bring a lot of changes. Yeah. yeah. Do you think in 10 years' time, these will still be there? That's a very good point in terms of um, are we worried that, you know, with changes in government, that a government may arise and say, you guys are not really, you know, doing what you need to do. We want to cut. Um, uh, what I believe is that as long as we have value-added products, if we generate value that people are seeing, I believe it will be hard for any government to say you are not needed. Again, so that's my perspective. Again, um, that's the much we can do. I don't really make those decisions. But then I do hope that if we're able to show that this is very valuable, and not just us, the farmers and the producers, the, the, you know, the, the public that uses the information, um, oftentimes government policies are based on what the public tend to want. Not always. Sometimes the public wants something and the government you know, wants something else, right? But then I, what we can do and what we can control is what we would like to do and always want to push to do, and that is creating value-added products, making sure that what we do is relevant. And that's also part of why we are going into the data application, making sure that even if we can save a farmer from, you know, again, applying a fungicide on that fusera, like, on like FHB, even if it's just one pass and saving the farmer $10,000 for that one pass, that's a win. And if we now aggregate that one pass over, say, you know, 2,000 farmers in the province, so if we can show the value in what we do, I believe that we would be sustainable. But again, there's always that, that risk. It, yeah, it, it's yeah. a possibility. Yes, yeah, just to add, you know, we're doing this for food security. Yeah. yeah. And it happened. Yeah. So, yeah, no, there's always a risk. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think there's always a risk um, of, in, in that, really. And I would also say, again, part of the partnership we are building with the university is also very critical, such that even if that ever happens, the knowledge that has been built over time can still be passed on, is, at least is the hope. So yeah, there's always the risk that any government program can be cut. Yeah. Thank you for Other questions? Um, what, what about the beta testing? Uh, was, uh, okay. uh, yeah, the Aquarius system looks it's yeah. very intriguing. Yeah. And, and so, are you? Do you have a list of people signing up here? Or? Oh well, um, I would say yeah, if you want to email me, that'll be great. But we, we do have um, farmers that are currently testing it out. We have um, some agronom agronomists testing it out. So we've had quite a few um, people kind of like giving feedback. So yeah, we would definitely welcome feedback. Um, so what I would do oftentimes is when I get emails, I would send um, the link because it's not public yet and would kind of encourage that you don't publicize it yet. So we send out the link, kind of like you go through it, give us your feedback on what you like, what you don't like, what you'd like to see. And I would say this is the initial phase. Um, so this is just the first phase. We still have other things we want to add to the Aquarius web portal. But yeah, so that's what we are kind of hoping for. Very exciting. Yeah, having that data access to Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the soil moisture reporting, you're reporting there, what level are you getting? For the soil moisture, yeah. so we do um, four depths up to 100 centimeters. So we've got five, 20, 50, 100 centimeters. Yeah. Um, you're not linked with the water level measurements at all? Right now we are not, but that's part of what we are hoping to do with the Aquarius. We are hoping that it's both the weather and the hydrometrics. And then at some point, again, hopefully the groundwater folks would be involved as well, so that we are able to bring. 
Right now, I would say no. But then we've had the conversation. So they are part of the conversation. Right now, actively, it's the, water, um, the stream flow and the weather that is involved in the Aquarius right now. But then the folks with the groundwater section are also involved in the conversation. And um, I would, again, it's something we are hoping that they would be willing to come on board. And I think, the, yeah, I think they are willing to. There is just, again, some the interdepartmental things that need to be worked out. No, no, it's not. I, I don't. Well, I, I shouldn't. I don't think it is. I shouldn't say it's not. I don't think it. I don't know so much about the network in terms of groundwater monitoring. I do know that I've requested data from them in the past for a specific location that I was interested in, and they would send the data to me. But yeah, I don't think they have like a public-facing um, website where anyone can go and get data. So it would be good to have the groundwater information added to the Aquarius web portal. <laughs> Yeah, so if I understand the question is if we are involved in projects looking at forecasting soil moisture. Oh, insects. Oh, okay, yeah. So um, we are not involved in forecasting insects necessarily, but I do. Uh, I work with a provincial counterpart, John Gavoski, and he is into entomology. So he typically would request data to look at, you know, again the insect um, pest population. Um, I don't know specifically how he uses the data, but again, um, there is limitless opportunities in what we can apply the data to, and that's part of what we're actively looking at in terms of what other um, you know, ideas are out there and studies that we can apply some of this data. Like again, insects, you know, weed um, develop, like so many other things that we can do. Currently, we have you know, a project looking at um, soil moisture forecast yeah, using a quantity uh, model is the other thing we're working on. So we've, we have a few projects on the go, but not on um, insects specifically right now. So if you have some neat ideas, we can definitely chat with you. for questions. So again, thank you very yeah, much. It's an excellent presentation. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, thanks so much, everyone.